everything I say in this video is based of how I see the industry from afar, the struggle most beginners go through and how the system works. This might be hard truth for some but guess what, I'm not here to tickle you but rather give clarification to the lost and confused 3D artist. Let's try to keep this clean in the comment section below without being rude. I love Blender and I love my 3D marks. Let's begin on some good notes. Blender has been used for a lot of effects in some dozens of commercial TV shows and movies. Besides, Blender was the main tool used to create the Netflix movie Next Gen. Blender is becoming more popular every day, especially in small shop work where the use of Blender often goes unnoticed. If this is it, then someone might ask, why is Blender still on the streets being the favorite amongst most small studios? Well, Blender is a jack of all trades and a master at none. There is no other single tool with as broad a feature set as Blender. If you have to pick only a single tool to create all visual content, Blender would win that category. With it, you can pixel paint, vector paint, mesh model, sculpt in multi-resolution or dynamic topology, 3D texture paint, rig, script, animate, simulate, render, VFX motion track, composite, grade, cut, assemble and do tons of other things and you can use all of those tools without a single import export working entirely within Blender. Oh and it's totally free. This is especially advantageous in smaller VFX projects. Now check this out, Autodesk pulled in 150 million in revenue last year in their creative tool department while Blender Foundation is probably bringing in under 2 million in annual Blender support. Whoa, why such a big market margin if that's what you're wondering? Well, aside from obvious differences in selling softwares versus accepting donations and the fact that more Blender users could donate, many seats for 3D tools exist at big studios and Blender isn't yet great at fitting into big studio pipelines, let me explain. Blender's power comes from handling the entire pipeline, not by being the best at any given piece of pipeline. Blender sometimes has challenges integrating with other tools and proprietary code because it's less popular on the level of production. Blender isn't as marketable a skill. Now this makes it harder to hire senior skilled Blender artists and that has contributed to its less popularity on highly marketable projects and I hope you know what this means, right? Large first world studios used best of breed tools. When a trained 3D artist salary is 80,000 to 160,000 plus USD per year and an artist typically specializes on one to two tools in a specific area of the pipeline, spending 2,000 to 5,000 USD for tools per artist is very affordable. Therefore, larger studios standardize around the best tools for the job, independent of the cost. Imagine a studio using ZBrush, Substance Painter, Maya, Houdini, Arnold and Nuke. Even if all their artists were magically Blender experts, which piece of pipeline should they swap out for Blender to get better results and efficiency? The answer is usually none of them. As broad as Blender's feature set is, it's not always the best at a given task. Blender's modeling, sculpting, compositing, rendering and VFX tracking tools are pretty well respected but are not the best in the industry and in other areas it's more than a decade behind state of the art. Blender modifiers and procedural abilities are very far behind decade old XSI, ICE and Cinema 4D MoGraph, not to mention modern Houdini. Also, Blender's clothes simulation while improving from 3.2 and above is still less usable than decade-old Maya and cloth. As we've talked about above, this situation is very different in a small studio, especially in less developed countries. If two artists are each being paid $50,000 per year, then buying them each $20,000 worth of software licenses to run the above pipeline is massive overhead. For this reason, using Blender is much better, especially if you know it can replace the entire pipeline for free with low quality but better efficiency. Maybe one might ask, so then why doesn't Blender fit well into multi-tool pipelines? 
Well, I hate to make bigger statements, but the real truth is Blender has challenges fitting into pipelines. Let's just say for now, simply because it's used both as one-stop shop and sometimes within people's pipeline. However, there's a difference between an artist doing a task with Blender and a studio designing their pipeline around Blender. In order for studios to do that, it needs to bring them notable advantages, of which lower cost is only a part of it with low risk. Unfortunately, there are some risks and roadblocks associated with a big studio going Blender. Blender has some awkward arbitrary limits and a couple of them will be limited in and out support and sometimes uses the GPL. Just imagine having to deal with frustrating awkward data limits. Limits like 16 materials per mesh, 8 UV maps per mesh and the fixed 20 layer grid system. That was before, right? Don't get me wrong. If you are old enough, you would remember Remember the famous quote where Bill Gates once said 640,000 was more than anyone needed. Hmm. It turns out we need more than 640,000, more than 16 materials, more than 8 UV maps and more than 20 layers. Blender's recent updates are really massive, very stable. They've managed to overhaul layers into collection with no limits and the 16 material limit is now removed along with Blender Eternals. It's unclear if or when the 8 UV map limit will be removed, though there is supposedly a workaround. Before version 2.5, even Blender the simple OBJ support had problems. Since then, it improved, and good Alembic support is really helping. Support for UDIM showed up in their 2.8 release, which was super exciting to hear. However, they can be very complex and very stressful to work with at times, not forgetting the elephant in the room, which is FBX. FBX is still one of the easiest way to move certain things between tools like rigged animated characters. Blender's FBX is still really limited, though we can blame this on Autodesk for creating an implemented defined standard. With a library license incompatible with GPL, studios don't care, they just want to get the work done. Game engines like Unreal Engine 4 and above have solved this issue with custom I.O. plugins for Blender. However, in order to fit into a broad spectrum of large pipelines, Blender needs a robust way to move complex data in and out of other tools, especially rigged characters. Colada, which was designed to fix this problem, was an industry failure. Hopefully, GITF or OpenGEX will eventually rival FBX for this kind of work. Personally, the GPL has always been a double-edged sword. By using the GPL, Blender can never get into the state where it's dependent on a bunch of commercial plugins to be effective. However, this also makes it harder to fit deep into commercial pipelines. First of all, the GPL makes commercial integration plugins hard or impractical to create because commercial closed C or C++ code is not allowed to link with Blender. Second, the GPL makes internal integration with the in-house C or C++ code base too legally dangerous. The question is, what happens if you give a binary to a vendor? Would you call that a release? Does that mean you have to open source all your internal codes? Corporate lawyers recommend against linking any proprietary code with GPL software. In the corporate world, you can use GPL software, you can improve GPL software, but you can't link any internal proprietary code with it. GPL proponents are quick to point out success stories like Linux, which has dominated both servers and smartphones. However, the GPL works well for the Linux kernel because Linux applications don't need to be under the GPL license because they live in a separate address space. Now, Blender does not have this luxury because 3D plugins need to live in Blender's address space, which means the GPL requires them to also be under the GPL. I argue that for Blender. The right license to support the hybrid open source nature of Linux success will be the LGPL or MPL2. That way, Blender's code will be free forever, but a still code support non-GPL plugins across specific plugin API boundaries. This and many more limitations Blender has to deal with. Now, the question is, how does Blender overcome these limitations? Obviously, it's very simple. Blender needs to become the best at 
every task. Humor aside, Blender would continue to make inroads in the corporate world as its feature set improves and as it becomes better at fitting into multi tool pipeline. As this happens, more artists will try it out and some of them will grow to like it. The more these artists use Blender and grow to like it, the more studios might standardize on it. Now, the more that happens, the more marketable Blender's knowledge will become and the virtual cycle will continue. Blender is going to make great strides. The software now has a real-time PBR viewport renderer called EV, which unifies shading setups with cycles and some dramatic improvements to clothes simulation. Meanwhile, work is already underway for one of the next big pushes, dubbed Everything Nodes, which I'm pretty sure would place Blender on a more competitive level with Cinema 4D's MoGraph Expresso. 3D's Max's MCG and Houdini. This is my best advice to newbies. If you are still saving up money to purchase Maya, Cinema 4D, Houdini or any other software that cost much, it's a waste of time, I'm not going to lie to you. Kill those lazy times using Blender. It's much easier transferring those knowledges to other softwares. Always remember to place your skills ahead of the two because if you are to jump on a different software after years of using Blender, you lack nothing and because you have developed the skill, all you need to do is to make some few changes to the new tool you just hopped on and boom, you are good to go. Instead of making excuses as to why you can't find a job, you know what, create one because Blender is free.